From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power. Live from Washington, D.C. From Bloomberg's Washington, D.C. studios to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. Alongside Kaylee Lines, I'm Joe Matthew. Just seven hours left until government funding expires, and the Senate has not yet passed the $1.2 trillion spending bill that made it through the House today, a vote that triggered a motion to vacate against Speaker Johnson filed by Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene. Today I filed a motion to vacate after Speaker Johnson has betrayed our conference and broken our rules. Donald Trump, meantime, facing an asset seizure as soon as Monday if he does not cover a bond due in New York civil suit against him, even as he now claims to have almost a half billion dollars cash on hand. We'll discuss his many legal troubles with former Watergate prosecutor Nick Ackerman. And Secretary of State Antony Blinken meets with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, suggesting alternatives to a Rafah invasion he warns could isolate Israel. We'll have more with retired General Ben Hodges. So, Joe, certainly no shortage of geopolitical news to watch on this yeah. Friday. But, man, did we get a lot domestically yeah, as well. For sure. From funding news to a motion to vacate, Congress was busy. Yeah, you couldn't, I guess, have one story without the other. Sure. As soon as that bill passed, Marjorie Taylor Greene filing a motion to vacate, which brought back memories, of course, Kevin McCarthy mm -hmm. uh, being called on the carpet for something similar. It took... Democrats, Kaylee, to pass this spending plan. To your point, we're waiting for it to go through the Senate. But in the meantime, as far as the speaker's concerned, Marjorie Taylor Greene, of course, of Georgia, spoke to reporters earlier about her effort. I do not wish to inflict pain on our conference and to throw the, throw the house in chaos. But this is basically a warning, and it's time for us to go through through the process, take our time, and find a new Speaker of the House that will stand with Republicans and our Republican majority instead of standing with the Democrats. Joining us now for more is Bloomberg's Megan Scully, who leads our congressional coverage. And Megan, we will get to, I guess, the, the attempt not to have chaos in the House <laughs> shortly. But we do also need to just get a status update, considering we are now just hours away from what could be a government shutdown if the Senate does not actually get this voted on in yeah. time. Where are we? We are waiting. Um, the Senate is uh, considering some kind of a deal on amendment votes, and that could happen any time now, or it could happen in the middle of the night, or it could happen later in the day tomorrow. Uh, we're just kind of watching and waiting at this moment. We spoke earlier today on the early edition of Balance of Power with Nicole Maliotakis, a Republican from New York who, like her colleagues, was outraged she voted against this package. No matter what we asked her, Kaylee, the answer was the border. And yeah. I mean everything that we tried. Is that really the sticking point here that's moving from the House to the Senate? That's a big sticking point. You know, ultra conservatives are not happy with the funding levels in the bill. They specifically wanted much deeper spending cuts mm -hmm. to um, domestic spending accounts. Uh, but it is the border, just like we're seeing play out with the election nationally. It's playing out on the Hill as well. And this language does not include a lot of the um, uh, stipulations and new restrictions, particularly on migrants asylum mm -hmm. that Republicans wanted. Well, certainly Marjorie Taylor Greene did not like what she saw, so she has filed this motion to vacate. She has not yet acted on it, though. She did not make this a privileged resolution, so the two-day clock has not started. Is this just all for show, or is there a real serious threat to Johnson here? Because there's also the question of whether anyone will join her in this effort. Well, it only requires one um, uh, to, to bring this to a vote on the floor. Now, remember, she has to go to the well of the floor to actually activate this yeah. uh, measure and to then stop all house business. And that is what has not happened yet. This is a threat hanging out there. And this threat is almost certainly tied to Ukraine. Mm. Marjorie Taylor Greene is very opposed to any additional funding for Ukraine. And that is a matter that the House is expected to take up yeah. when they return from a two-week congressional recess. So she's essentially signaling to the Speaker, you do that and... I'm coming to the well of the yeah. House and activating this. So that's her trigger. Will Democrats come to Mike Johnson's rescue? We've heard from a couple who said they might. Uh, yes, we've had some moderates say they might. Tom Swosey, uh, the mm -hmm. new Democrat um, who elected uh, to replace George Santos. 
he said that, that he would. But we did see some of this with Kevin McCarthy as well. Mm -hmm. And then all Democrats came together to vote to oust him. Mm -hmm. I think it really depends on what happens um, and whether or not Johnson can assure them on a Ukraine package. Megan Scully, we thank you for the update. And of course, we'll keep you posted on what happens. It could be a very late night or early morning in the Senate if they get this done. Elsewhere today, Secretary of State Antony Blinken wrapping up a visit to the Middle East amid negotiations over hostages and a possible ceasefire. He spoke with reporters in Tel Aviv after meeting with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. We've made progress in the last couple of weeks on the hostage negotiations, closing gaps, but almost by definition, when you get down to uh, the last items, they, they tend to be the hardest. So there's still a lot of work to be done, hard work to be done, but we're determined to try to get it done. Joining us now for more, Bloomberg's Josh Wingrove, who covers the administration for us here. Josh, it's good to see you. These dueling narratives are really something. Pushing for a ceasefire in negotiations at the same time is hearing from Israel that they will invade Rafa no matter what the U.S. says. How does the president rationalize these two? I mean, the, the president basically is, has asked them to hold off for now. And they left the door open a lot today, the Americans did. I should say that this, they're, they're not sort of trying to draw a line in the sand or anything, and they are not telling Israel what to do. So they seem to be at least preparing for the option that, you know, these talks won't yield anything. The talks that we're talking about will be here in Washington next week or so. Jake Sullivan came out uh, a few days ago and, and announced that this was the intent. Biden is trying to at least publicly put pressure on Netanyahu to back away from this and explore other things, even going so far as to point out that there are sort of hot spots flaring up in areas that Israel had previously cleared and that the Americans are saying, more or less, you haven't done a good job to keep Hamas from sort of re-entrenching in places that you thought you cleared, so you need to be more methodical about it. The pressure, of course, domestically for Biden here is that there are calls from particularly the progressive wing of his party, also young voters, Arab Americans and Muslim Americans, to do more to, to press for either short-term or long-term ceasefire. The Americans have sort of tried so far to have it both ways, you know, saying that there is a ceasefire on the table and they want it, but it's up to Hamas. Yeah. Um, so they, they're really pinned right now. But this is a lot of democratic or, or diplomatic, excuse me, pressure that the administration is putting on it. This is the sixth or seventh trip by Blinken there, meeting with Netanyahu, the, yeah. leading up to this meeting, the Biden call, which is the first in a month between the two leaders. They're trying to put a lot of pressure on it. It's just not clear that it'll be enough. Well, among the things that Blinken said today was that if Israel goes ahead with an operation in Rafah, it risks isolating itself. Yeah. But it can only be isolated from the U.S. to a certain extent because President Biden isn't just going to walk away from Israel, right? So I just wonder how far those words really go if that real threat is not actually there. Yeah, it's not clear to me what appetite there is in Congress for any, you know, move to either claw back either rhetorically or tangibly support for Israel, but you know, Biden has been breaking with it. It seems to be that he's speaking almost past Netanyahu mm. and to the Israeli people, but there's been some reporting that maybe he'll make another visit or that they were considering another visit. It's a little unclear. Uh, trying to create sort of the political pressure domestically in Israel to, you know, give room for uh, Netanyahu and his kind of ne nebulous coalition of, of government to, to take a different path. But right now there are sort of warning signs everywhere. And of course, in the background of this is the aid question, which is, yeah. You know, they continue to not be able to get enough aid in. They're building this pier. Doesn't think they're, they're going to get a lot of food in through that. They continue to say trucks are the best way. They're airdropping stuff. It's not enough. The aid question is really hanging in the air. The warnings of famine, particularly in the north. This is a dire situation. It is one that could pay political consequences domestically for the president. That's why they're putting a lot of energy into it. But you're absolutely right. Right now, it's not clear what sort of firm leverage they have. It seems more they're trying to carve out a way for the, the, the domestic political pressure in Israel to, to guide Netanyahu to a certain direction. All right. Josh Wingrove of Bloomberg, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Now, another story that we're following at this hour, at least 40 people have been killed and over 100 wounded in an attack by gunmen at a Mos Moscow concert hall tonight. Two explosions were also reported, according to Russian security and wire services. The attack occurred at a popular shopping mall and concert venue on the edge of the Russian capital. Russia's Federal Security Service says a terrorist investigation has been opened. Also today, we've learned Kate Middleton, the Princess of Wales, 
is being treated for cancer. The 42-year-old wife, the heir to the British throne, saying in a video statement today that abdominal surgery in January uncovered the cancer and that she's been undergoing chemotherapy, which she described as preventative. White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre reacted to the news during today's daily press briefing. We just heard, obviously all of us just heard the terrible news. Our thoughts are with the Duchess of Cambridge and her family members and friends during this incredibly difficult time. And certainly we wish her a full recovery. Coming up on Balance of Power, we'll continue the conversation about Israel's war with Hamas. Ben Hodges, former commanding general of U.S. Army Europe, will be with us next on Bloomberg Radio and TV. major military ground operation in Rafah is not the way to do it. Uh, it risks killing more civilians. It risks uh, wreaking greater havoc with the provision of humanitarian assistance. It risks further isolating Israel uh, around the world and jeopardizing its long-term security and standing. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken in Tel Aviv earlier today speaking about the risks of an Israeli operation in Rafah. Let's bring in now former commanding general of U.S. Army Europe, Ben Hodges. General, always great to have you here on Bloomberg Television and Radio. Thank you for joining us this evening. Antony Blinken, during this visit today, also said that he would provide the Israelis or the administration would with alternatives to a major ground operation in Rafah. What might that alternatives, uh, any of those alternatives be that would prov provide Israel with the means to do what it would like to do in Rafah? Well, I, I can imagine that it's going to be something about uh, some sort of guarantees from uh, external, uh, not forces, but uh, other countries that could put pressure on Hamas uh, somehow. Perhaps that's what it would be. I mean, of course, for the Netanyahu government to, to turn away from an attack on Rafah, which it has been telegraphing now for weeks, uh, they would have to have something that they could turn to their own supporters and say, this is an acceptable uh, alternative. It's hard to imagine what that would be, though, that the Netanyahu government would accept it. Of course, Netanyahu's government has said that it will not stop until it removes Hamas from Gaza. And Hamas is, of course, clustered now in Rafah. Uh, General, you know the strategies, the playbook, and the weaponry used by the IDF. To what extent will it be possible for IDF soldiers, for the military as a whole, to conduct precision strikes and preserve the lives of civilians in that area? Or will you tell us that it's not possible? Well, um, let, me, let me try it this way, Joe. Um, I, I would imagine that the professional soldiers of the Israeli Defense Force uh, will do what they can uh, within that sort of a context to limit the casualties. But I don't know how you can actually significantly limit uh, civilian casualties when you're talking about so many people packed into such a, uh, a dense urban area, because uh, obviously they're going to be they're going to be shooting into buildings. They're going to be launching precision weapons into buildings, and you have no idea who all's inside those buildings. So th this is uh, difficult, and this is where I think uh, the administration is running out of patience with the Netanyahu government and is going to, I mean, almost the only thing they have left is either a breakthrough solution on the hostages or uh, to tell the Israelis, you can no longer use weapons that we provide on anything that is involved with Rafa, for example. I mean, they, they can, in mm -hmm. fact, restrict mm -hmm. where these things are used. Well, General, just how difficult will it be to reach that breakthrough on the hostages? How hopeful are you for a ceasefire agreement in the near term? Well, of course, when you're talking about dealing with Hamas, uh, I have zero confidence that we know exactly uh, what, who they have, who's still alive. Uh, and I, I'm also not entirely sure that Hamas even controls completely all the hostages uh, that, are, that are still alive. Um, I think Secretary Blinken 
and his team have done a great job working with uh, other countries in the region to try to get uh, some sort of solution. Um, but uh, we're at the situation, of course, where one side's saying, we're not going to do anything or we're not going to stop until we get all the hostages. And the other side is saying, we won't release all the hostages until there's a ceasefire. So that's that kind of intractable situation that the secretary uh, was referencing. General Hodges, we're looking at a dire situation as well in Ukraine right now, following a barrage of missile attacks from Russia against its energy infrastructure. The Zaporizhia nuclear power plant was taken offline for five hours. This is something that months ago we were very concerned about. And I wonder, as Vladimir Putin has succeeded in using the cold as a weapon, will he use that power plant as a weapon against Ukraine? Well, certainly um, the uh, the possibility is there because uh, Mr. Putin clearly has, has demonstrated very clearly he doesn't care about any risk to civilians or the em environmental impact of the kind of activities uh, that they conduct. So uh, you have to take these threats seriously, but this is also why you cannot uh, treat him as a responsible uh, negotiating partner that somehow anybody can work out an agreement or uh, negotiate a, a clear, uh, acceptable solution to this war in Ukraine. And I, I think the only way he ever gets stopped is if the United States, if we declare that we want Ukraine to win, that it's in our strategic interest that Ukraine wins, and then we commit to providing everything that they need to win. That's the only way that Putin is ever going to be stopped. Otherwise, he will continue doing exactly what he's doing. And he feels now that he probably has a mandate to do that um, after this uh, fake election. Well, sir, just hours ago, we saw Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene file a motion to vacate against the House Speaker, suggesting that what would actually trigger that vote to oust him would be if he puts Ukraine aid on the floor of the House. She is fundamentally opposed to any more U.S. dollars going to Ukraine. What would you tell the Congresswoman? Well, of course, I'd point out to the Congresswoman that Almost no money goes to Ukraine. The vast majority of money in these aid packages actually goes to uh, U.S. defense industry uh, to produce the things to replace what we provide to Ukraine. So it's a it's a willful misunderstanding understanding of the process, and it also um, is strategically illiterate because uh, the benefit of Ukraine defeating Russia is that it conveys to the Chinese uh, the biggest long-term threat that we are serious about sovereignty, respect for international law, respect for human rights. So this is part of part of deterring China from what it might do, which would be a real problem for the United States. It's also about American economy. What Russia does against Ukraine um, directly increases prices in the United States for food and energy because of the disruption of food supplies and energy supplies by Russia. So it helps us economically if Ukraine is able to defeat Russia. So I, I would think, uh, Congresswoman, uh, that she would be better advised and better informed about why this is important versus somehow a blanket or uh, using uh, every maneuver she can to block this aid mm -hmm. uh, from coming to Ukraine. Well, as you know, General, strate strategic literacy is not always in ample supply here in the nation's capital. It's good to see you tonight. Retired General Ben Hodges with us on Balance of Power. Coming up, a potential financial lifeline for the former president, Donald Trump, ahead of a very important day Monday in his legal future. We'll have more next on Balance of Power, Bloomberg TV and radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. I'm Joe Matthew alongside Kaylee Lines. Former President Donald Trump could be on track for a big payday after investors voted to approve a deal that would bring his media startup public as soon as next week. For more on this, we bring in Bloomberg's Bailey Lipschultz. Bailey, this is a big deal because he's facing a big bond that 
he apparently may not be able to cover with a deadline on Monday. This is Truth Social we're talking about, right? What's about to happen? Yeah, the parent company of Truth Social, Trump Media and Technology Group, Truth Social is the crown jewel of that, uh, as they call it, media empire. It's really just one app. Uh -huh. um, it, it, he stands to basically make on paper, if this deal does go through in the coming days. Uh, his shares will be worth about $3 billion. He has the potential to earn out additional shares that, based on where they closed on Friday today, could be worth another $1 billion, though that is all locked up alongside the likes of Devin Nunes, so he can't technically right. access that for six months unless they move that deadline forward. Okay, so basically the earliest he's going to be able to actually reap the reward from this is in September, when we could be well into a second criminal trial for for all we know. So it's going to be a while before the money's actually in the bank for him, Bailey. Most likely, we've seen SPACs, which are kind of like the Wild West, where you can move those deadlines forward. So if the board of directors does vote to approve to unlock Trump and some of those other insiders, he could either sell or take out a margin loan against those shares sooner than later. But as it's structured right now, about six months, to your point, uh, closer to the end of September is when the current uh, prospectus would allow him to sell. Okay, so the strategy is you move, you delay the trials, move those mm -hmm. back, you move the SPAC up here in this case. Of course, Bailey, he could probably use this for collateral uh, to work out a loan, correct? Yes, and that's something we've talked to professors and lawyers about. It gets a little bit muddy because as long as those shares are locked up, at least from the people I've talked to, it'd be a really risky bet for a bank to lend him money with the idea that they're going to sell the shares at the current levels some six months down the road. So that's really kind of where it gets a bit murky, but it does kind of all lean into the ability for A, this deal to close, Trump media to trade under the ticker DJ, DJT uh, potentially next week, and then the ability for him to either take out loans from a bank with that as collateral or outright sell. Bailey, we have less than a minute left, but just quickly, as, as the former president often likes to tout his expertise, if you will, as a businessman, is this a profitable company? Like, what are the actual <laughs> fundamentals here? It is not. It uh, reported revenue of about $4 million in the nine months through September, uh, and it lost $49 million over that stretch. So not profitable, wow. not really growing, um, but they uh. do seem to have a lot of retail traders who are willing to pay a high multiple that Amazing. most people on Wall Street wouldn't agree with. All right. Well, I guess we'll see how trading goes if it debuts next week. Bloomberg's Bailey Lipschultz, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate your time. Now, coming up, speaking of the many legal battles that the former president is trying to fund, we'll discuss them with Nick Ackerman, former U.S. assistant attorney and former Watergate prosecutor, as he faces a hearing on Monday in a criminal case and, of course, that bond being due in a civil case. We'll have more next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio. I think it's going to be in April. Judge Mershon wants this to go. And Alvin Bragg came out with a fire brief. It was a takedown of Donald Trump, showing that Trump's all about delays. This is a yeah. stall tactic. And of the 170,000 new documents that Trump says, well, we got to take all this time to review, only about 270 pertain to this case. And of the 270, most of them are uh, what you call inculpatory, meaning incriminating. They help the prosecution, not the defense. Uh -huh. So Judge Mershon, I think, is not going to delay this any further. Oops. That's the take from Palm Beach County State Attorney Dave Ehrenberg speaking with us earlier today here on Bloomberg. Joining us now as we head for an important day on Monday for Donald Trump's legal future is Nick Ackerman, former assistant U.S. attorney, former Watergate prosecutor. Mr. Ackerman, it's great to have you back here. Uh, you have here. tried to speak to the veracity of this case, Alvin Bragg's case, in a way that some other legal analysts have not here, have tried to downplay the significance of it. With that said, what do you expect Alvin Bragg to tell us on Monday? I think what he's Judge going to tell everybody and tell the court is that he's ready to go to trial, he's ready to put on his case, and that it should go to trial on April 15th, tax day. Hmm. I think that's what he's going to say. Okay. Do you think the judge is likely to buy that, considering that Trump and his legal team are asking for a much longer delay? Oh, they're always asking for a delay. Absolutely, he's going to buy that, uh, particularly when you just heard 
uh, the fact that there are only about 275 new documents, none of which really amount to a hill of beans um, that really don't relate very much to this case. So there's no way that by April 15th, all of these lawyers, including Donald Trump, can't read these 275 documents. We're talking about a six week trial uh, at this point, right, Mr. Ackerman? That said, you start this in April, there would still be ample time for another trial to take place if the Supreme Court rules against Donald Trump in this immunity case that's before the court. Oh, absolutely. Uh, that, that would actually dovetail quite nicely uh, because if the Supreme Court rules, as I think it will, uh, that Donald Trump does not have immunity on the allegations in the D.C. case relating to January 6th, then that case will follow right after the one in New York, which would be quite fitting because the one in New York really relates to how Donald Trump won in the first place by lying to the voting public about various people who had information on him and keeping that information um, disclosed from the public or on, you know, mm -hmm. secret from the public. Whereas the mm -hmm. other case really relates to how he tried to stay in power after he became president. So the two cases really dovetail nicely with each other. Well, and of course, it's not the only two criminal cases he is facing. There is also the uh, election subversion re uh, racketeering case in Georgia, as well as the documents case in Florida. We had reporting yesterday that Fonnie Willis, who, of course, has been allowed for now, although it's pending appeal to stay on that case, despite uh, concerns about uh, the fact that her former partner was on the case and being paid. She has suggested still, according to this reporting, that she would like to see that case go to trial this summer before the election. Is that really realistic, Nick, considering her even ability to be on it is still facing appeal? Well, I, I think that appeal is really going to go nowhere. The judge issued a very detailed, um, well-reasoned opinion. Um, it's very clear that the defendants did not meet their burden of showing any kind of conflict here. So what it really comes down to is Will Fonnie Willis's case go before the case in Washington, D.C.? And if the Washington, D.C. case goes first, will the Georgia case follow that? Um, both of these cases actually hinge on the Supreme Court decision uh, with respect to presidential immunity, because both of them relate to um, criminal activity perpetrated by Donald Trump while he was president. So I think what will happen here most likely is that once the Supreme Court holds that there is no immunity here, the D.C. case is likely to go first, um, and that could be sometime in June or July. And then after that, I would expect that we'll see uh, the Georgia case follow. Don't forget, the Georgia case is going to be a bit longer of a case. There are more defendants. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated mm -hmm. because of that. The D.C. case is only one defendant. Donald Trump, which was designed that way, especially because they wanted to keep it simple uh, and to make it a fairly straightforward trial. We've got two uh, important moments that will arrive on Monday. One we've already talked about, that's the hearing in Alvin Bragg's case against Donald Trump. But he's also got a deadline to put a bond in this $454 million judgment against him in the civil fraud case in New York. The Attorney General, Letitia James, could begin trying to seize his assets as soon as Monday. She's even taking a look specifically at properties in Westchester County. Do you think that actually happens, or is that a, just an empty threat? Oh, no, I think it's real. I mean, she could have done this 30 days ago. She gave him 30 days as grace period to try and get it together. Uh, it's obvious he cannot, even though he said this morning that he had $500 million in cash. Well, if he's got $500 million in cash... That's going to be the first amount that Letitia James is going to seize uh, with a restraining notice on Monday. What you can do with that judgment is basically um, just blanket the town, blanket the world with restraining orders until you get all $500 million. And it's not only his properties, but it's all of his bank accounts and brokerage accounts. Uh, and once she does that, yeah. that's it. Well, if you were his campaign manager, for example, your answer to this question would probably be different. But if you were his attorney, would it be prudent?
for Trump to just file for bankruptcy? Is that the advice you would give? That's probably the only out he has. And even that is only going to delay matters for a bit. Uh, even with that delay, the interest is going to continue to run on the half billion dollars that he owes. So, yeah, it, it probably is the most prudent thing to do if he thinks there is some way that he can get the money together in the next few months and use that breathing time to do that. Um, but I don't really see any viable alternative here. Uh, even what we did, you discussed earlier in the show about this media company that he's got, um, I don't know who would ever put up a half a billion dollars uh, with that stock as collateral down the road, which at the end of the day may not be worth that much because this is not a company that is at all profitable. In fact, as you, we just heard, it's losing a lot of money. So there's no way to know what that's really going to be worth over the long term. And on that basis, I can't think of any normal investor or anybody who would be foolish enough uh, to put up a bond for a half a billion dollars based on that stock. All right. It's always great to have you on the show, Nick Ackerman, former U.S. assistant attorney, former Watergate prosecutor. We appreciate your insight. Now coming up, we'll be joined by our political panel to discuss their take on what happened in Congress today. There was a lot of news, including a motion to vacate that was filed against House Speaker Mike Johnson. This is the real March Madness, isn't it? Uh, it's uh, pretty nuts, performative politics. Uh, but based on a, a significant, I would say, portion of the membership of the GOP, they certainly think he deserves it because he sold out, you know, to the, in quotes, I'll put this in air quotes, you know, the globalist Democrats. Former Republican Congressman Denver Riggleman's view. We'll get the view from Rick and Jeannie next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. a new speaker. This is not personal against Mike Johnson. He's a very good man, and I, I have respect for him as a person, but he is not doing the job. The proof is in the vote count today. He passed a budget that should have never been brought to the floor, did not represent our conference, and it was passed with the Democrats and without the majority of the majority. That was Republican Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene of Georgia on Capitol Hill earlier today after filing a motion to vacate against the House Speaker, though not actually acting on it yet. She still needs to go to the well. We'll see if she ever does. Let's bring in our closers for this discussion. Rick Davis, partner at Stone Court Capital, and Jeannie Shanzano, political science professor at Iona University. So, Rick, she said today that really this was a warning. She has not made this a privileged motion. It is not formally kicked off yet. It's just filed. Is this an empty threat? Or is Mike Johnson have reason to be worried this evening? I think Mike Johnson has the same reason to be worried tomorrow that he did yesterday. Okay. So it doesn't really change a thing, right? He was always subject to this kind of a motion. And the fact that there actually is one, but, you know, hasn't been called, it doesn't really matter. So uh, my, my feeling is Marjorie Taylor Greene found a good way to get news on a Friday afternoon, mm. uh, right before everybody left for two weeks. And Nobody is taking this seriously that I talked to as they were racing for their airplanes this <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> and so I don't anticipate it in two weeks being any more real than it is tonight. Well, I had a feeling you'd say that, Jeannie. If, if Marjorie Taylor Greene really wanted to fire Mike Johnson, she would have uh, activated this today, right? It would be a privileged uh, resolution and we'd be waiting for a vote on this. Now she can go home, recess and raise money. Yeah, that's right. And she got a lot of airtime today. She said it is not, you know, it is not a firing, but a pink slip, which is interesting. But, you know, there is still time for Marjorie Taylor Greene. They're off for a two week break. And, you know, you guys talked to Nicole Maliotakis today. She voted against the funding bill. There is a lot of Republican yeah. discontent about the, the passage of the government funding bill. A lot of frustration with the, with the way it was done. He could not get the majority of the majority 
majority. So I am very curious to see over this two week recess, do they hear anything from their constituents, particularly about the all important mm -hmm. issue of immigration? Because as you watch what's going on on social media today, it is, you know, in addition to the unfortunate news about Princess Kate, all about what is going on at the southern border. If they are able to couple that and blame Mike Johnson for a bill which wasn't tough enough on that border, this may get resurrected again when they come back in two weeks, particularly if he tries to take up the Ukraine funding bill. Yeah, well, that is certainly what Marjorie Taylor Greene was suggesting today. But Jeannie, as you talk about the funding bill, which passed with more Democrats than Republicans, it was the minority that got this over the finish line, not the majority. And it raises the question about the role Democrats would play if indeed this motion to vacate actually does become privileged, if Marjorie Taylor Greene were to act on it. This is what Republican Congressman Mike Lawler of New York said about that earlier today on the steps of the Capitol. Take a listen. The Democrats went along with Matt Gates. They should make it very clear that they're not going to go along with Marjorie Taylor Greene. There's nothing to negotiate. There's nothing to give. There's no request to be had. They should just make it clear they're not going to participate in this. So, Jeannie, obviously he's referring to the fact that Democrats did not protect Speaker Kevin McCarthy, then Speaker Kevin McCarthy, when Matt Gates uh, moved forward with the motion to vacate against him. Should they do things differently this time around? Does Mike Johnson deserve that? You know, I think they may. We heard from Tom Swazi today, the Democrat from Long Island, that he would likely support Mike Johnson because he doesn't think there's any reason he should be booted for passing a government funding bill. That said, let's all take a step back. Republicans trying to blame Democrats for any chaos in terms of their own speaker is almost laughable. They cannot govern their own con conference, and that is the problem. So, yes, Democrats probably will save Mike Johnson, but that's not going to do much to save the chaos of what's going on in Republican leadership today. We spoke earlier today with Denver Riggleman, the former Republican congressman from Virginia, who couldn't believe what was happening as we were talking live here on the air and talked about what might follow if Marjorie Taylor Greene does, in fact, succeed in ousting Speaker Mike Johnson. What Marjorie Taylor Greene says and what she does are usually opposite things. Um, and if you look at what happened today, right, you have somebody who's self-identified as a Christian nationalist going after Mike Johnson, who believes he's been called to be in that position, you know, by God, you know, almost have their own God on God violence here. You can comment on that to the extent you wish, Rick. Mm -hmm. But your point earlier was he's at as much risk tomorrow as he was yesterday. But if Mike Johnson survives this motion to vacate saga with Marjorie Taylor Greene, does that not strengthen him in the end? First of all, there's no survival, right? And and there's no vote. There's no and survival. it's just it's just blue smoke and mirrors, right? And and just on this vote, right? It's a free vote for Republicans. They knew all the Democrats were going to support it, but yeah. t but ten, and so you need a hundred Republicans. As soon as you got to hundred Republicans, every Republican who supported voting for the budget said, "I can take a walk on this vote now mm -hmm. because it's a free vote for me, mm -hmm. and I'm going to position myself as saying, hey, we got to focus on the border.'" So it is an election year. All these guys have to go back to their district. The ones that voted, the Republicans that voted against this budget are going back to say, oh, we should have done more on the border. Right. They were for passing the budget. So if it's they had been tie-breaking vote. votes, it would have been different for these guys. That's but important. We had 138 of these guys, plenty enough to pass this thing. Yeah. And everybody who voted no knew that that was going to be the outcome. And they did it for political purposes. It's not like this big caucus, you know, where everyone's <laughs> melting down. Yeah. Marjorie Taylor Greene melted down today. Nobody else <laughs> did. Let's put it in perspective. Well, of course, the news today didn't end with Marjorie Taylor Greene, though. Today was actually Congressman Ken Buck's, Buck's last day That's right. in the Republican conference. And we also got the news today, Rick, that Mike Gallagher, the chair of the China Select Committee, is not just retiring. We already knew that. He's not even seeing out this term. He's gone. April 19th. What does that say? This majority is going to go down to a margin of one in a few weeks. Yeah, no, this is like a, a most amazing thing. I mean, the, members of Congress don't want to be there. I mean, there are almost 50 members who are retiring or amazing. have already left. And, and by the way, equal number of Democrats, right, right, who have said, the heck with this, I'm not running again. And so, you know, you've got a situation where you have a record number of open seats going into a very tough election year. Uh, and then you have a situation that you've described, which is razor thin margins to begin with. And it just reinforces what I think we've been talking about for some time is that now that this budget is done, the focus will go on to the supplemental and then nothing else between now and Election Day. Yeah. Right. There's just no 
impetus and no votes to do anything other than either a bipartisan bill like on the supplemental, which will need to be bipartisan, or, you know, just sort of routine political measures that will pass on a, you know, uh, a, a party line vote mm-hmm. alone. And even a party line vote only needs two people to yeah. upset it. So <laughs> it's going to be a do-nothing this Congress all the way through, through the end in. of its term. Jeannie, we can add Kay Granger. This is the stepping down early as chair of the Appropriations Committee after coming up with this appropriations bill that just passed today. Doesn't that tell us a little bit about how well things are going? Yeah, they're not going too well. I mean, you look at the people stepping down as well. These tend to be more of the institutionalists, as I describe them. These are the people who put their nose to the grind and want to do work. They aren't the show men and women out there trying to get free media time. Those are the ones like Mike Gallagher who are retiring. I mean, let's not forget, he was one of only three Republicans who voted not to oust the Homeland Security, uh, the, the chair of the Homeland Security, Secretary of Homeland Security. So these are the people leaving. And I tell you, that's what we're going to get in the next round. If these sort of institutionalists keep leaving are a lot of show people trying to make a name for themselves and fewer people doing the business of the government. And that is a loss for all of us. What a time to be alive. Coming up, Donald Trump is running out of time to pay New York after losing the state's civil fraud suit. We'll dive into the details next with Rick and Jeannie. On Balance of Power, only on Bloomberg TV and radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. I'm Joe Matthew alongside Kaylee Lines in Washington. Donald Trump's almost half billion dollar appeal bond is due in just a couple of days in New York State's civil fraud suit. It's on Monday. Back with us now, Rick Davis, partner at Stone Court Capital and Jeannie Shanzano, political science professor at Iona University to help us get through all of this and how it might shake out for the former president. Rick, it appears he doesn't have the money uh, to post this bond and the proceeds from his SPAC will arrive late. We could be in a world where the attorney general is seizing Trump properties. Is that the very kind of thing that would help him at the polls? You know, he would certainly demagogue it, right? I yeah. mean, you know, this is the kind of thing he did very successfully early on when he told everybody that they're not indicting me, they're indicting all of you. Right. They're not taking my assets, they're taking your assets. <laughs> and, uh, you're, if, once they get done with me, you're next. Yeah. And, as if, like, you know, they're going to come and start knocking on your door and taking your car away. Mm-hmm. So uh, I think it's much more a optical problem than it is a financial problem, right? In other words, they'll put a lien on properties, sure. still his properties, and he'll get to appeal, and it won't be like he's taking out-of-pocket money, mm-hmm. right? It's not going to take cash out of his pocket in order to satisfy the bond. Mm-hmm. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think it's bad press. He's supposed to be the great deal maker, and the next thing you know, uh, his, his, his properties are all going to be encumbered, in addition to the encumbrances that are already on him, and that's yeah. been part of the problem. Well, and of course, that's not just the only legal thing we'll be watching when it comes to the former president on Monday. Jeannie, there's also going to be a hearing in the Alvin Bragg case and potentially a new trial date being given. We were just talking to Nick Ackerman, former Watergate prosecutor, who said tax day, April 15th, this thing's going to trial. Is that the point in which Trump's ability to use these legal battles in his favor might actually change because he could actually face risk of conviction? Yeah, he he absolutely could. And, you know, I don't think there's any universe in which any of this is good for Donald Trump politically. I mean, if you just step back and think about it, he says on Truth Social today that it looks like he has the cash. All kinds of questions as to where to make the bond, all kinds of questions as to where that cash came from. Even his attorney was answering questions on Fox about, did it come from a foreign entity? He obviously can't declare bankruptcy. That would make him not a very good businessman. And so, you know, any way you slice this, if he does have the Alvin Bragg case starting in April, the fundamentals of this campaign are a disaster. He's got money problems that we've never seen in American presidential campaign mm-hmm. history. So how he yeah. surmounts that, um, you know, if you're looking, who would you rather be? At this point, you'd rather be Joe Biden, bad polling numbers huh. and all in the face of this. We're out of time here, Rick. This is someone very sensitive about their net worth. He's exposing to everyone. He doesn't have the cash. 
Does that work against him and his reputation publicly? Yeah, it's a kind of a weird dueling, you know, storyline. Yes. Because on the other side, it's like, hey, he's worth $3 billion with this new IPO that's about to go out there. So, right. <laughs> you know, it's the kind of thing that uh, there's never a clear shot on Donald Trump. And that's the magic of Donald Trump. The magic of Donald Trump <laughs> and our panel. Rick Davis and Jeannie Shanzana, we thank you both for being with us. We survived another week. Yes, Congratulations, we Washington. Yeah, we can do this. I'll meet you back here on Monday. In the meantime, check out the Washington Edition newsletter on the terminal and online. Happy weekend, everyone. Thank you for joining us on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. <laughs>